Much love. Thanks for tuning in. I had read an article in one of my old series, um, I believe part 10 of From Indigenous American to African American, I believe either 9 or 10, regarding Gory Island. So I wanted to actually follow up on that. We're going to debunk the whole Gory Island uh, slaves uh, story, the mansion there, the door no return. It's completely false. It's pseudo history. Shame on all academics that still go off that today. Simple research would show you that the story they tell us in school is completely false. There's a different story behind uh, this place, this location, this island, the people there. We're going to uh, try to get into it a little bit. But I'm also going to go over some articles regarding this topic. Several of them, some of them in French, we're going to translate. This whole story was invented and driven of the emotions of people. They made a whole tourist attraction based of this false history playing on people's emotions. So all those people that are actually listening right now who will get emotional because of this, you got to realize it's facts over feelings. This ain't personal. It's just history. We're going to tell the story correctly so we can get a better understanding of the overall picture about what really went down with this so-called transatlantic slave trade. We've been breaking this down in many ways in past videos. We know who the Portuguese and the Spanish were really enslaving. We know American indigenous slavery did exist. We know a lot of those people were brought over to West Africa, to Europe by these same Portuguese, French, English, Spaniards. So we're going to get into this video. Hope you guys enjoy it. Just wanted to show you what's on the screen here. It does say, what does Heiwa mean in Japanese? It actually means peace, guys. A lot of the times I'm, I'm saying peace to you. So Heiwa, peace, Heiwa, peace, huh? Peace, harmony, peacefulness, peacemaking, peace out. Heiwa, peace, Heiwa. So I know you see Sudo on the uh, cover of the video and uh pseudo you know it's that's what we're gonna go over today pseudo history false or spurious things okay especially person falsely claiming divine authority from medieval latin in modern use of things imitated and exaggerated all right they exaggerated they created all these stories of persons pretentious insincere all right insincereness all right they're lying from 1945 as the noun in the modern sense, all right, pseudo, fake, false, on top of conjectures, all right, conjectures, interpretation of signs, dreams, and omens, <laughs> also a supposing, a surmising, you're supposing, right, you think that's what the story is, 
from old French conjecture, surmise, to guess, you're guessing. You assume the Spanish and Portuguese were enslaved and Africans. That's conjecture. The primary sources don't say that. Directly from Latin, conjectura, conclusion, interpretation, guess, inference, all right? Your inference is that when they say colored or anybody being of color, that it has to be an African person. That's your guess. That's your interpretation and conclusion. That's not the truth. Literally, a casting together of facts, all right? You're just putting mad things together. You're babbling, all right? You're just making mad things up, all right? You're guessing, conjecture. So we're going to get past all the pseudo history. We're going to get past all your conjectures. That's all you guys have is conjectures when it comes to uh, trying to so-called debate this information and all that. It's all conjecture. You're guessing. So what do most people think they know about Gory Island, right, in the story, right? So simple search on Wikipedia, right? In this case, they will believe Wikipedia, right? <laughs> So simple search in Wikipedia says Gori Island, right? It's the city of Dakar, Senegal, right? It's an island really close to uh, Dakar in Senegal. Two kilometers at sea from the main harbor of Dakar, famous as a destination for people interested in the Atlantic slave trade. Now listen to this, right in the very first paragraph says, although its actual role in the history of slave trade is the subject of dispute. Oh, okay. The subject of dispute, right? History and slave trade, huh? Let's keep reading. It says the island was not settled before the arrival of Europeans. You hear that? There was nobody there before Europeans, supposedly. The Portuguese were the first to establish a presence on Gori on 1450, just like they say about Cape Verde Islands, where they built a small stone chapel and used land as a cemetery. Now listen to this. Gori is known as the location of the House of Slaves. All right, that's what we're going to get into today. Or oh, the Maison, the Maison de Esclaves, the Mansion of Slaves, right? Or the House of Slaves, built by an Afro French Metis family about 1780 to 1784. Hold up. So, again, remember, are we using conjecture? Where are they getting the Afro from? So, they're French. And their metis, what is a metis? Metis. So real quick, right? Just to follow up, the metis, when you click on that link, it just popped up. It brings you here. It says, refers to a group of indigenous peoples who inhabit Canada's three Perry provinces, as well as parts of Ontario, British Columbia, the Northwest Territories, and Northern United States. They have a shared history and culture and are of a mixed European primarily French and indigenous ancestry which became a distinct group through ethnogenesis by the mid 18th century during the fur trade era all right so most of the time when you're talking about Metis you're talking about French and indigenous people coming together Metis right we know the history and the background of who these French in general were that were settling Canada, especially amongst the Metis, these Acadians, these people in Quebec and all that. A lot of them were Huguenots, Moorish. These were black French Protestants. And it was customary for them to take on indigenous women. It says here in etymology, Metis is the French term for person of mixed parentage and derives from the Latin word mixtus or mix. Starting the 17th century, that's the 1600s, right? So this is way before Gory Island, right? The term metas was used as a noun in connection with the fur trade and by settlers to refer to people of mixed European and indigenous American parentage in New French, which extended from southern Quebec through the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River, all right? So all that, and even Indians from those areas were also being called metas. They were mixing with the French. At the time, it applied generally to French-speaking people who were of partial ethnic French descent. It also came to be used for people of mixed European and indigenous backgrounds in other French colonies, including Guadeloupe in the Caribbean, Senegal, all right, Senegal, Gory Island in West Africa, what? So again, when you got Senegal, Metis, 
right? This is a Facebook page random I found. Just look at this picture. <laughs> Senegal Metis. When it comes to Senegal Metis, so again in Senegal, right? They have a source here it says Jones 2013. That's the Metis of Senegal. Life and politics in West Africa. Let me just show you guys. All right. This is the book right here. The Metis of Senegal. What do they mean by that? huh? And this is what the author looks like. Hillary Jones. The word Metis is generally used to refer to mixed race children of the Union of French colonists from France and women from the colonized area. Throughout France's worldwide colonies, the first Metis was a female child born in 1628 near Lake Nipissing, given the first name Margaret who was the illegitimate daughter of a Nipissing Indian woman, all right, American, and Jean Nicolette de Bella Born. That's probably a Moorish French, born about 1598, likely in Cherbourg, France. As French Canadians followed the fur trade to the West, some of the settlers made unions with different indigenous women, including the Cree. Descendants of English or Scottish and natives were in some cases historically called half-breeds or country-born. They sometimes adopted a more agrarian culture of subsistence farming intended to be reared in Protestant denominations. All right, who's the Protestants? All right, we've gone over this information. Make sure to check out my Acadian uh, video, my French Acadian video, the Cajuns, and um, my Huguenot uh, videos, Sephardic Jews, Moorish videos to get more in depth. So I just wanted to go over real quick. Let's go back to what we were reading. Again, Gory is known as the location of the house of slaves right built by an afro touch the hijack french metis look what comes up metis refers to a group of indigenous people in habit canada all right that's what's coming up so you know dash the hijack with the afro the house of slaves is one of the oldest houses on the island it is now used as a tourist destination to show the horrors of the slave trade throughout the atlantic world all right so how true is it though how true is it so this is wikipedia all right all right so you, you know dash the hijack so you guys can see this is actually from the unesco world heritage site we're gonna see the role they played in the hijack in creating this false story all right why and why do we allow it why do these so-called uh pan-african scholars knowing this is a myth because we're gonna get their words their own sources saying it's a myth why do they allow it to be told that way? It shouldn't matter that it's an emotional attachment. All right, UNESCO World Heritage Convention, the island of Gori lies off the coast of Senegal, opposite the car from the 15th to 19th century. It was the largest slave trading center on the African coast. Ruled in succession by the Portuguese, Dutch, English, and French, its architecture is characterized by the contrast between the grim slave quarters and the elegant houses of the slave traders. All right, that's the hijack. We're going to see all this is false. So stay tuned. All right. I'm going to show you guys what I'm talking about. Make sure to grab a seat. Get the popcorn. <laughs> grab your notebook and pad. It says here the island of Gori testifies to an unprecedented human experience in the history of humanity. Indeed for the universal conscience. This memory island. All right. Check it out. See how they're wiping their hands. They're telling you a memory. It's just about a memory. It's not actual factual. This is how they're writing it. I just realized that as I'm reading this. It's the symbol, symbol, it's just a symbol of the slave train with this cordage of suffering, tears, and death. The painful memories of the Atlantic slave trade are crystallized in this small island of 28 hectares lying 3.5 kilometers off the coast from the car. Gori owes its singular destiny to the extreme centrality of its geographical position between the north and south and to its excellent strategic position offering safe haven for anchoring ships hence the name good raid thus since the 15th century it has been prized by various european nations that have successfully used it as a stopover or slave market all right so again i'm reading what people normally would think they know about gory island this is what is taught today and what they want to trick you literally into believing actually happened in this actual mansion or place and it didn't happen all right we're gonna keep going the island gory was designated a historic site in 1944 that's when they started the hijack with safeguarding measures right that's when the country started realizing they could make money off it it was subsequently inscribed in the national heritage list in 1975 
and on the World Heritage List 1978. Not until the 70s, what happened in the 80s? Oh, let's start calling people African Americans. Right, this was right after the civil rights movements and all that. In 1979, a safeguarding committee was created by order comprising all the stakeholders to monitor compliance with the convention. All right, this is when they were setting up, all right, to start the hijack, the false, the pseudo history. Back in Wikipedia, it says here House of Slaves. The House of Slaves or Maison des Clavos and its door of no return is a museum, a memorial to the Atlantic slave trade. All right, you see this? It was set up as a symbol. We're going to read about this, guys. Hold up. Just, just bear with me. Its museum, which was opened in 1962 in the 60s and curated until Bubakar Joseph Nadia's death. All right, so this guy is very important. He played an important role in the hijack. Who is he? We're going to read about him a little bit. All right, what did he do? It is said to memorialize the final exit point of the slaves from Africa. While historians differ on how many African slaves were actually held in this building, as well as the relative importance of Gory Island as a point on the Atlantic slave trade, you understand? It's debatable. All right? Look what it says. Tiny island weather storm of controversy. It's archived, guys. It's hard to find. CNN Interactive. They took it out. They took this article out, but we got a little bit of the article. We're going to read it. All right? Visitors from Africa, Europe, and the Americas continue to make it an important place to remember the human toll of African slavery. So it's literally a memorial. It's just a memorial of a pseudo-history. I am making this up, says here, academic controversy. Since the 1980s, academics have downplayed the role that Gori played in the Atlantic slave trade, arguing that it is unlikely that many enslaved people actually walked through the door. And the Gori itself was marginal to the Atlantic slave trade. Nadiaje and other Senegalese have always maintained that the site is more than a memorial and is actual historic site in the transport of Africans to European colonies in the Americas and is underappreciated by Anglophone researchers. Constructed around 1776, the building was the home in the early 19th century to one of a class of wealthy colonial Senegalese women trader, the Signoris, all right? That's their names. That just literally means in Spanish, señoras. They were called señoras, but in French, señores. Annie Pepin or Anna Colas Pepin. So these are two different people. That's her niece. All right. Researchers argue that while the house owner may have sold small numbers of enslaved people, may have, all right, may have, may have, that's conjecture. You understand? That's what I'm saying. I'm, we, we, we only deal when it comes to Pan-Africans, we deal with pseudo-history and conjecture. So she may have sold small numbers of enslaved people kept in the now reconstructed basement. It was reconstructed to make it look like a cell. It wasn't even a holding cell, guys. And kept a few domestic enslaved people. May have, right? The actual point of departure was 300 meters away at a fort on the beach. The house has been restored since the 1970s. All right, we continue here. We're in Le Monde, newspaper or journal from France. Le myth de la maison de esclaves qui resiste a la réalité. Say what? <laughs> so don't worry, guys. We're going to translate this right now. Again, that's the title, The Myth of the House of Slave Resistant Reality. This is by Emmanuel de Roux, published in 1996. All right, but still very relevant. It was actually downplayed. Nobody really paid attention, right? So what we're going to do is grab this whole uh, article right here, not a lot, and we're going to copy, bring it to uh, Google Translate. It says here, the house of slaves on the island of Gori appears in all the guides. Not a single tourist will miss visiting this monument to a sinister past. He will be welcomed in the courtyard of this red ochre building by an inspired Ciceroni, Joseph and Diani. All right, so look at this. So that's the same guy we're going to uh, read about. He's the one giving all the tourists the tour and, you know, adding the whole uh, slavery hijack and all that, making up a lot of things. It says a former non-commissioned officer. The latter recounts with emotions the story of this slavery built by the Dutch in the 17th century, pivot of the slave trade in Gori, which saw hundreds of thousands of Africans marching chained towards the New World. The different sales are de 
detailed those of the men, those of the women, and those of the children. The dungeon for the rebels and the door for the one-way journey, which opens onto the ocean. A double spiral staircase leads to the apartments of the slave traders. The France Liberté Foundation of Daniel Mitterrand, as evidenced by a plague, financed part of the renovation of the building. The House of Slaves has become part of the heritage of humanity, especially since UNESCO has classified the whole island in this category. The problem is that everything is false. All right, that's the only problem. Guys, did you hear that? The problem is that all that, all that stuff we just read from the beginning of the video to now, all the African slave stuff is false or almost as explained by Adulaye Kamara. All right, who is Adulaye Kamara? And Father de Benoist, a Jesuit historian researcher at IFAN, the house perfectly identified has nothing Dutch about it. It was built by the French in 1783 for Anna Colas, a wealthy mixed race lady, when the slave trade was coming to an end, all right? Mixed race or Metis, <laughs> Anacolas, Metis, French indigenous. All right, so we get in the backdrop. It was built by Nicolas Pepin for his daughter Anacolas Pepin. The lower rooms may have been used as accommodations for domestic slaves, but certainly not for the slave trade, all right? Not for the slave trade. They were essentially goods warehouses they were warehouses they were not for people all right just a regular warehouse they added the chains and all that later on in the 60s and 70s to add to the tourist guide right but basically a lot of these people had apprentice people working for them or indentured servants not slaves like how they teach you today the slavery because it existed was not far from the fort which now houses the historical museum she disappeared Finally, Gori was never a very active center for the slave trade. 200 to 500 slaves per year, maybe, that's what they're saying. If we are to believe the figures of the Jesuit scholar, if we are to believe, compared to the counters of the slave coast, the current Benin, the Gulf of Guinea or Angola, all right, that's the hijack. The legend of the house of slaves owes everything to the undeniable talent of Joseph and Daye. All right, he made it all up, who took 12 years to forge a myth which today has the force of law, all right? So that guy was passing on some uh, myth. Who did he learn it from and what, who sent him? How did he get appointed there, all right? Who's these gatekeepers? Again, that was from a Le Monde uh, article from 1996. You can look it up yourself and read it yourself in French. All right, so real quick, we're here at the uh, Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, the George Washington University history news network because the past is the present and the future too all right it's very important to tell the story correctly what does it say here the myth of gory island the myth of gory island is not just me by cleopatra all right this is from 2004 gory island senegal standing in a narrow doorway opening onto the atlantic ocean tour guide alaji nidai all right same guy asked a visitor to this Senegalese island slave house to imagine the millions of shackled Africans who stepped through it, right? He made that up. Forced onto overcrowded ships, he made that up, that would carry them to lives of slavery in the Americas. He made that up. After walking through the door, it was bye-bye, Africa. <laughs> That's what he told people in the tour. After walking through the door, bye-bye, Africa, said Nadaye, pausing before solemnly pointing to the choppy waters below. Many would try to escape, those who did died. It was better we gave ourselves to the sharks than be slaves. All right. It's emotional, right? You add emotion to it. You add a whole this story to it. And it just becomes very personal. This portal called the door of no return is one of the most powerful symbols of the Atlantic slave trade. Serving as a backdrop for high profile visits to Africa by Pope John Paul II, President Bill Clinton and President George W. Bush. All right. The Pope went over there. Come on, man. Bill Clinton, oh yeah, 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 and George Bush, oh yeah, these are homies, right? All three of them, these are these are good people, these are homies, yeah. They're gonna they're gonna definitely go and tell the truth over there and not not be part of the lie. No, not these three guys. And a destination for thousands of African Americans in search of their roots, in search of what roots? Dash the Haja, you see, you see what they did, tricking people. More than 200,000 people travel to this rocky island off the coast of Dakar each year to step inside the dark, 
dungeon-like holding rooms in the pink stucco slave house and hear details of how 20 million slaves were chained and fattened for export here. Many visitors are moved to tears, all right? They make people cry. I told you it's all about emotion, playing with your emotions. They fatten them up, huh? And exporting them to America, huh? But whatever its emotional or spiritual power, Gory Island's real role in the slave trade remains a matter of dispute, a contest between history and the power of myth. Despite the claims by Senegal's tour guides and tourism industry, Gory Island was never all right, again, was never a major chipping point for slaves, say historians, all right? Stop adding conjecture. Stop with the pseudo history. Stop making things up. Show me the primary sources. No slaves were ever sold, all right? No slaves were ever sold at what is known as the house of slaves. No slaves were ever sold at what is known as the house of slaves slaves again we're at the columbian college of arts and sciences the george washington university website all right history news network no slaves were ever sold at what is known as the house of slaves no africans ever stopped through the famous door of no return to waiting ships either it's all false the whole story is phony the whole story is phony says Philip D. Curtin, a retired professor of history at the Johns Hopkins University, who has written more than two dozen books on Atlantic slave trade and African history. <laughs> so the funny thing is, is Philip D. Curtin is actually, he's a professor of Atlantic slave trade history, right? <laughs> he's an expert in the, in the hijack, and even him is debunking them. He's like, no, and my calculations and numbers and from my sources very little that I have <laughs> it didn't happen there in Gory Island at all not especially in that house he knows it for a fact he knows it. he has a whole book you can look it up read his book it's on archive.org first used as stopover by Portuguese sailors in the 15th century Gory Island was bought for a few iron nails by the Dutch before being seized by the French and the British Although it functioned as commercial center, it was never a key departure point for slaves, Curtin says. Most Africans sold into slavery in the Senegal region would have, the, would have, again, would have, that's conjecture, he's guessing, would have departed from thriving slave depots at the mouth of the Senegal River to the north and the Gambia River to the south, he says. All right, again, I want to emphasize you guys, would have would have he doesn't know he's guessing that's conjecture so all his work his expertise on that atlantic african slave trade right is based a lot of it on conjecture of what everybody always assumes that people were being grabbed from africa so they become so expert even though they're really good at writing these books and stuff and even though he knows gory island is fake He's still part of the hijack because he's still guessing he's adding conjecture to his work. What primary sources is he reading to add conjecture? If he had the primary sources, he wouldn't be guessing. He would say, oh, it happened in this location by this ship, by this person in this year. Here is the book. Here is the first hand account. You understand what I'm saying? During about 400 years of the Atlantic slave trade, when an estimated 10 million Africans were taken from Africa, dodged a hijack, all right? So blah, 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 all right? Even then, they would not have been locked in chains in the house of slaves, Curtin says, built in 1775-1778 by a wealthy merchant, a wealthy, who's the merchant, huh? A French merchant, French merchant named Pepin, all right? It was one of the most beautiful homes on the island. It was a mansion. It was a mansion. It was a home. It wasn't no slave quarters. It would not have been used as a warehouse for slaves other than those who might have been owned by the merchant or worked or were apprenticed to him and lived with him in the rooms, not in no basement. Likewise, Curtin adds the widely accepted story that the door of no return was the final departure point for millions of slaves is not true. There are too many rocks to allow boats to dock safely and a beach nearby that would have been the easiest place for loading ships, he says, all right? It was 300 meters away. We already read there's too many rocks there. It wasn't for that. 
Curtin's assessment is widely shared by historians, including Adulaye Kamara, curator of the Gori Island Historical Museum, which is a 10-minute walk from the slave house. The slave house says Kamara offers a distorted account of the island's history, distorted, a pseudo, it's false conjecture created with tourists in mind all right they did it to make money tourists in mind and keep the light going because we were about to wake up in the americas all right so we continue here right we're in the washington post now democracy dies in darkness yeah and when the lies are told we also die in darkness that's why we're doing this right this article was published more than nine years ago I've read this article in one of my uh, videos, older videos, from Indigenous American to African American series, I believe nine, part nine or ten. I'm going to go ahead and read it over now that we're really talking about it today. And it says here, the sincere fiction, all right, the sincere fiction of Gory Island, Africa's best known slave trade memorial by Max Fisher, July 1st, 2013. And over here we got Obama <laughs> looking out from the fake uh, house of slaves So he's still trying to hold on to this uh memorial right he's still saying it should still be there it's symbolic for us you know the house of slave holds a huge amount of symbolic value as a place of memory a testimony to a not so savory part of global history all right so they're just talking about their lie their pseudo transatlantic lie in this sense the house was erected into a myth or perhaps a term i'd prefer to follow sociologist pierre bourdieu a sincere fiction it's a sincere fiction so just because it's sincere we're supposed to just like you know it's still a fiction and mobilized as memento as far as archives will go the house was built probably in the 1770s thus rather late in the era of the atlantic trade all right it's really late at a point when the commerce and slaves was diminishing and when the gum trade was gaining ascendance what's more it was a residential structure upper floor were living quarters lower sections were probably for merchandise and magazine you see it wasn't for people and yes the enslaved people living there were probably attached to the house cooks domestic laborers traders etc even family some people use the history memory coupled to parse the problem of Corey's house of slaves example history concerned with facts and memory with symbolic value and historical gravity a mode of effective resonance absolutely central to identities in the african diaspora all right so you see it's all about emotions it's all about emotions continuing the article says a point of entry is a nice way to describe gory's famous monument which is after all a literal entry point the door of no return as some scholars have written even if his slaves never really existed through the door <laughs> members of the african diaspora created by slavery have since used the site as a way to engage with that legacy making it sort of like a door of, of return to a past that was very real even if the symbols official history is not all right it's not real guys this but you see what they're saying 
Let's just make it a symbol, even though it's not real. <laughs> President Obama and his solemn visit there Thursday seems to have had a similar experience, even if it was based on a small myth within a much larger truth. So when Obama went, he realized it was a myth. It was just a mansion. He was so disappointed. <laughs> But really, this door of no return, they're calling it the re door of return, but it's really, it really is the door of no return because we're not returning to the lies after this. There's no more going back. No return for real. All right, we continue here. We're in the uh, Internet Archive Wayback Machine. Luckily, some of these uh, Internet articles that have been around, that have been deleted, are archived in uh, this uh, website here. Uh, this is an article from CNN. It says a bridge to Africa, Senegal. Date written, 26th of March, 1998. It says here from Mark Cornblow, executive director. All right. H Africa subscribers might be interested to know that the following CNN article on their website is entirely derived from a 1996 discussion on Gori Island from H Africa. And there's a link. When you click on the link, it brings you to page not found. All right. So... But luckily, they've been able to maintain the conversation a little bit. It says here, Tiny Island Weather Storm of Controversy. I remember that by CNN Interactive writer Andy Walton. It says here, CNN Gory Island in the harbor of the Senegalese capital of Dakar is barely 80 acres, but it has become the battleground in a war of ideas. War of ideas, not truth. Ideas. An emotional emotional conflict it's it deals with emotions people's emotions surrounding the study of history and the business of tourism oh tourism money making huh the island's Ma maison de esclaves or the house of slaves has become a popular tourist destination especially for african americans all right so who's going over there and giving them the money african americans people from here that are, that are probably indigenous to America with some black European ancestry in them. The island was designated by UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization as a World Heritage Site. Pope John Paul II visited the island in 92, and Hillary and Chelsea Clinton took a tour of the slave house last year. U.S. President Bill Clinton is scheduled to visit during his trip to Africa. But some historians say the island was a minor slave center at most and that the history of the slave house is being intentionally intentionally distorted and a drive for tourist dollars okay this is why they took this article from the internet that's why you can't find the original in cnn all right they're intentionally distorting history they're creating pseudo history adding a bunch of conjecture to drive for tourist dollars from who African Americans to tr keep tricking them and taking their money. Quiet controversy heats up. A December 1996 article in the French newspaper Le Monde brought the issue to the surface. The article quoted Adulaye Kamara, the curator of the history, the House of Slaves, a myth. Kamara has since denied making the statement, supposedly, right? The article prompted angry reaction in Senegal, particularly from Joseph N. Diaye the European and Lebanese curator of the slave house. Huh? Hold up. Wait a minute. Joseph, so the guy that's been given the tours and adding this false history, he was assigned. He's the one doing it for years and years and years. He's European and Lebanese? Really? All right, so we're in Gory Island, right? Where's Gory Island? Gory Island right here, the car. All right, Gory Island is right here. Where is Gory Island and the car and all that? Senegal, West Africa. Here's the Cape Verde Islands, right? Oh, a whole history on Cape Verde. We're going to get into that. Why do you think we're doing this? All right, to show you that they weren't coming out of here and going into Cape Verde. They're lying about that. Actually happened in reverse. So he's European, right? So he's a European. He's, he's black, but he's European. And he's Lebanese. Whereas Lebanon, right? Le but I just showed you, but there you go. Where is Lebanon? Right here. Lebanon, right? Mediterranean. This is what you would consider what? The Middle East, right? Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Israel. Lebanon is right here. Okay, so he's Lebanon and he's European and he's Lebanese. He's not even African, right? 
some would say well he's still black and you know so we came from africa well that's conjecture again you're using conjecture you're guessing and he went all the way to west africa over here to work in this gory island to help push a lie that he knows is not true and he's not even from this area do you guys understand that i'm showing you this is deep who is he we're gonna read about him if you go back again joseph and Dayaye, the european and lebanese curator he's not even african of the slave house and Daya says that 40 million slaves passed through the house of door of no return he calls emmanuel de rooks the author of Le Monde article accuses him of having a hidden agenda but the story only alerted more people to an issue that had been simmering among the historians for decades in august 1995 john hopkins university historian philip curtin called the slave house a sham and an internet mailing list Curtin said that the House of Slaves has become an emotional shrine to the slave trade rather than a serious museum. He said that no more than a few hundred slaves a year were transported through Gory Island and that 30,000 total experts through Gory would be an outside estimate. Right? So he's still trying to add some hijack, but he's letting you know it's, it's a sham, it's phony. He, we already read what he said. A little further down says, but the debate is more than academic for Senegal's growing tourist industry. It's going to hurt their pockets which some fear may be threatened by the controversy. The country's tourism department reports that Senegal's hosted 321,000 tourists in 1995, up from 282,000 in 1994. Gory Island has been profiled in several articles, including uh, one featured on CNN Interactive's Black History Month page, and a $15 million hotel and conference center is in the works you see so there's money at stake here this is even way back remember this was written in the 90s this they took this article out as you guys can see here 98 they took this article out of the uh, internet however the debate among academics entrepreneurs and officials is resolved if it can ever be resolved the island still attracts pilgrims and still evokes awe the walls of the slave house remain impo imposing and silent all right it wasn't even a slave house we're at the Baltimore Sun and you know, they're saying powerful symbol, but it's very weak in facts. And they're just copying the other article. Although it functioned as a commercial center, it was never a key departure point for slaves. The Slave House says Camara offers a distorted account of the island's history created with tourists in mind. No one is quite sure where the Slave House got its name, but both Camara and Kurt and credit Bubakar Joseph Nadaye to Slave House's curator since the early 1960s we're promoting it as a tourist attraction you see so it was this guy who was making up the light where did he get it from right he's not even african he's from europe and lebanon okay so he must be french lebanese nadia is famous in senegal for offering thousands of visitors chilling details of the squalid conditions of the slaves holding cells the chains used to shackle them in their final walk through the door of no return joseph nadir offers a strong powerful sentimental history I am a historian. I am not allowed to be sentimental, says Kamara. All right, so you can see this is an ongoing uh, debate. This is from 2004. All right, now we're in senateweb.com. We're going to read this article is in French. It says here, La Maison des Claves de Gori, un myth invente. A myth invented. All right, so we're going to grab this right here. Bring it over to uh, Google Translate, and let's go ahead and read it. It says non-exhaustive anthology of questions that should give rise to contradictory and fascinating debates at the Soborn Paris on the generic team. The end of the myth of the House of Slaves and Gory. A team that will be introduced by Jean-Luc Anglin, author of Celeste or the Time of the Signoris. The presentation note for the event is unequivocal. The conference being announced as that of the negation of Gory as a historical physical reality of the slave trader. The myth of the so-called slave house was invented by Pierre Andrew Carew. I listened to this. It was invented by this guy, Pierre Andrew Carew, chief medical officer of the French Navy, stationed in Gori in 1940. It appears in the form of an unedited manuscript, which was to lead to the edition of a historical novel. This is where it all started, guys. Listen, we read in the presentation document 
Further, we promise to make known, speaking of the door of no return, how a simple garbage shoot has been transformed into a myth within a myth. It was a garbage shoot. No people were put on boats from that door of no return. Do you guys hear this? They play with our emotions and they play with our intelligence. According to the same source, the history of the so-called slave house must imperatively be deconstructed because it prevents the real work of memory, which must be built around the research work of African scientists. University C. Anta Diop in particular, West Indians, Black Americans and others. It is, we add, in a process of positive deconstruction, reconstruction, that the university conference will be held at the Soborn which will allow black researchers to present research work on the role of gory in the slave trade. All right, they had a conference about this. All right, so again, that's this article right here. A myth invented, right? We got another archived uh, document here. This is from the uh, John Hopkins University by Philip Curtin, 1995, East Tennessee State University. The subject is gory in the Atlantic slave trade. Gori was never importing in the slave trade, which flourished in Senegambia, only at the mouth of the Senegal to the north of the Gambia to the south. All right, dash the hijack. But Gori is an interesting 19th century town that can be used to attract tourists, especially African Americans looking for their roots. The leading figure supporting the hoax today is a man named Joseph N. Diage. I remember he's from Lebanon and he's European, who is the curator of the house that has long been called the House of Slaves. It was actually built in 1775-78 as the home of a wealthy trader, a wealthy merchant, a merchant trader, French, who may or may not have kept a few slaves on the lower floor at some time, all right? He didn't. It was a warehouse. It has been called the House of Slaves at least since my first visit there in 1955, though the slave trade shrine that N. Diage has developed dates from 1970s at the earliest, all right? That's when the real hijack started. The reason for calling it the House of Slaves is uncertain. It is architecturally one of the finest houses on Gori, certainly not a place where slaves would be kept. It is on the shore, however, and had a first floor leading to the water. It may be that people began imagining that slaves could be sent to the sea by that route. Slaves were not kept in traders' houses in any event. The claim that the House of Slaves was a slave shipping point has been refuted as long ago as 1958 by Raymond Moni. Shortly afterwards, the first professor of African history at the Sorbonne, Le Gilles Blues, Afrique Leolis, on slave numbers, and Diage used to claim that 20 million slaves were shipped from Gori, 5 million of them to the U.S. at the time of my visit in February 1992. He had increased the number by 40 million. Meanwhile, the government historical museum at the end of the island of Gori gives a range of 8 to 10 million, reaching the new world from all of Africa. You hear that? So look at the numbers don't even match the whole of Africa to what he's saying. A lot of people have been taken in by the Gori scam. They even had the Pope out there in late February 1992. But Pope knows that. He ain't being scammed. He's playing along with the scam. But scam has no following at the local university. The House of Slaves has become an emotional shrine to the slave trade rather than a serious museum. Slave exports from Gori began about 1670 and continued till about 1810 at no more than 200 300 year in important years and none at all in others. All right, so that's his estimates, which are based on a lot of the stuff might be actually Indians or Tambo or just apprentices and indentured servants, Moorish, Sephardic Jews uh, being persecuted, Protestants, all that. All right, so that was. Uh, again, this was removed from the internet as well, as you can see why. All right, so now we're going to get into uh, uh, Bubakar Joseph Nadaya, all right, the gatekeeper, the guy who was making everything up, the, the person they're blaming, even though he got it from the, the guy we read about earlier in the 1940s who made it all up, the story. So he learned it from him, and he just got really good at, uh, you know, acting it out and everything. We're going to read he was an actor and everything, so... We're going to translate uh, this little by little, see what it's saying about uh, Bubakar. And we get this first paragraph right here. It says, Bubakar Joseph Nadaya, born 1922, died 2009, presented himself as the chief curator of the House of Slaves on the island of Gori. He remains one of the best known Senegalese figures, especially among tourists, 
Even if recent scientific work on the slave trade and the history of the island has led to his passionate words being put into perspective, right? So it's controversial, right? Going back into his bibliography, as it says here, copy all this, bring it over to Google Translate. Coming from a family of Gorean origin, Bubukar, Gorean origin, remember they said European and Lebanese, Gorean origin. They mean from Gori Island, but you know, his parents, he's he's not even African. His parents are from different places. Bubakar Joseph Nadaya was born 1922 in Rufiski. He did his primary studies in Gori, then joined the Pinet La Prairie Vocational School in Dakar. He then worked at a composer, typographer, called up in the French Army in 1943. He participated in the liberation of France with the with the first army. Engaged among the Senegalese skirmishes. He fought in Italy, notably during the Battle of Mount Cassin. After the liberation, he also served in the Far East as a paratrooper, non-commissioned officer in the 1st Half Brigade of Colonial Paratrooper Commandos under the orders of Lieutenant Colonel Marcel Bigard, veteran 1939-45 in Croix de Guerre, officer of the National Order of the Line, Knight of the National Order of Merit, Knight of the Senegalese Order of Merit, all right? So all these secret order fraternities all of a sudden, because he had a lot of clout based on his war experience, right? We'll give him that, all right? So he joined his, uh, you know, he got connected and got into all these orders, right? So secret societies. He was appointed curator of the House of Slaves in Gori in 1962. Why? And held this position until his death. They made sure, right? He was the one there all those years, imagine, for almost 40 years. He died in the car on February 6, 2009 at the age of, <laughs> look at the age, probably 86, right? Following a long illness and rest in the Lyon Cemetery of Camberon in the car. All right, we're going to grab this part now and bring it to uh, Google Translate. It says here, for four decades, the charisma, not devoid of humor, on occasion of the master of the place, has left no visitor indifferent each time he recounts the daily hell of the slaves who would have been detained in this sinister place before leaving to be shipped bluntly to the new world where other vicissitudes awaited them. Gori in his story becomes a real hub of the slave trade. Several works have questioned and detailed the narrative defended with fervor by Joseph Nadaya, an article by Emmanuel de Rox, journalist for the French daily Le Monde, The Myth of the House of Slave, which is his reality, has given rise to some stir beyond the community of specialists. Another controversy has erupted over the actual authorship of Joseph Nadaya's children's book. All right. Thanks to the determination of Joseph Nadaya, the famous house was nonetheless restored by UNESCO in 1990 and may still agree in recognizing its value as a place of memory, all right, memorial, all right. So even though it's fake, remember, even though it's fake, all right, he still was able to like help uh, UNESCO keep the light going and create a museum and all that, and a tourist attraction. I'm going to grab this part, it says cinema, television. It says the Algerian director Rachid Bou Karet was inspired by this strong personality for the character of Alion, played by Sotigu Kuyate. In little Senegal, an old guide from the House of Slaves goes to America and search for his ancestors. You hear that? In addition, Joseph Nadaya himself played his own role in the American feature documentary The Healing Passage, Voices from the Water, by Sandra Sharp, and more recently in Ruder Agori, a Swiss film featuring singer Jusu Nador, 2008. All right, so he's done some acting, all right, so he's pretty good at it, though. We're going to read now about the Maison des Claves in this French article. All right, Wikipedia. All right, we're going to grab that first paragraph and translate it. It says, the House of Slaves is a historic building located in the island of Qatar. Okay, we know all that. Now, it says here, despite historical studies which have shown that the House of Slaves would not have played the role attributed by some in the slave trade, it remains a place which for many has great symbolic significance as an emblem of the slave trade. All right, even though it's fake, they kept it as an emblem. All right, a totem, a memorial. It's not real, though. It's a fake story so then it talks about the importance of conserving it right and then um it's the unesco's uh, role in restoring it right in creating this this patrimony uh, for the country and the world right and then we're going to get this part right here we're going to copy paste this part right here so we got a lot here translated let's go uh into it this is the article by a journalist from Le Monde, Emmanuel de Rousse, dated December 96, entitled The Myth of the House of Slaves, which resists reality, calls into question the figures peddled by Joseph Nadaya 
Emmanuel de Roos relied in particular on the work of two researchers and curators from IFAN, Fundamental Institute of Black Africa, Abduli Kamara and the Jesuit Father Joseph Roger de Benuis. Gori, they claim, would never have had the importance attributed to him by Joseph Nadaye in the slave trade. It would be, continues the article, only a skillfully maintained myth. All right, a skillfully maintained myth. Thereby, the House of Slaves was not built by the Dutch, but by the French in 1783 at a time when the slave trade was ending. The house was built for Anna Cola Pepin. All right, Pepin. That's their house. A signori, a wealthy metis. A wealthy metis. Again, a wealthy metis. They didn't even say Afro, right? They said a wealthy metis. Metis, right? Etymology online <laughs> as a noun, person of mixed parentage, especially French Canadian and North American Indian. Again, especially French Canadian and North American Indian, 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 not an African Indian, especially French and Indian, French and Indian. Again, the house was built for Anna Colas Pepin, a senora, a senor, wealthy metis, a metis. Mix, mixed with what? French and Indian. The rooms on the ground floor were not used for trading, but probably as accommodation for servants, all right, apprentices, and as warehouses for goods, all right? They weren't any uh, slave quarters there. The slavery that did exist was located near the current historical museum. Gori was not an important slave center. According to Father Joseph Rogers de Benoist, between 200 and 500 slaves transited there each year. All right, so that's, you know, hijacked too. The Jesuit is hijacking still. Gori suddenly decided itself depriving the public imagination of the central place it occupied in the triangular trade and the affair aroused great emotion in the island. A controversy ensued involving various other experts such as Philip Curtin and American specialists in counting the Atlantic slave trade, or the Senegalese historians Abdouli Batali and Mabaye Gueye. These historians maintain that Pink House was perhaps not built by the Dutch but by the French and not in 1777, as has often been written, but rather in 1783. All right, so this is very late. By that time, they weren't really doing the slave thing, exporting supposedly, even in their historical accounts. The owner would have been Nicholas Pepin brother of the senor Annie Pepin, all right? That's who built it, and that's who um, is Annie Pepin's brother, herself mistress of Chevalier de Boufflers in the apartments and offices on the first floor. The inhabitants of this Borgers residence would have been mainly concerned with the trade in gum, Arabic, ivory, and gold. Disregarding the slaves employed on the ground floor, pavement, moreover, the famous gate overlooking the ocean could not have been used for boarding the rocky coast not allowing the docking of ships, okay? Public controversy swelled, prompting the organization of a symp symposium held at the Sauburn in 1997 on the theme Gori in the Atlantic slave trade, myths and realities. In order to appease people's minds, the symposium in particular made it possible to specify the conditions in which, based on the novel by French naval doctor Pierre Adre Carreau, all right, it was a novel, it was myth. Just like Roots, stationed on the island in 1940, the myth of Gori was able to be forged. It was based on a fictional novel by this guy. And that's who this guy learned it from. Listen, all right, it's a myth from a novel, all right? So this is Abdullaye Kamara. It says Abdulli Kamara is a researcher at the Fundamental Institute of Black Africa at the Cheek Anta Diop University of Dakar, Senegal, where he conducted research in prehistoric archaeology and managed museums. He received in June 2018 in Paris with his team Senegal, France, Switzerland, the award of 18 World International Union of the Prehistoric and Proto-Historic Sciences Congress for the Large Archaeological Excavation Site of Long Duration in the Felon Valley. All right, now... This guy, they're saying, remember, he wrote this book right here, Gori, the Island and the Historical Museum, how it was, you know, he's telling you the truth. Look how much this book is worth, $760. Yeah, so this guy can tell you that it was a mansion, and this is where the slavery really happened in this uh, fort, right, they, they built like 300 meters away, not in that house. They never went through there. He's making it all up, you know. It was more in mind for tourists as he stated all right so that's him right here so you guys can learn from him too he's telling you yourself yeah 760 dollars right so annie pepin right annie pepin is supposed to be the sister of nicholas nicholas pepin who built the house for his daughter anna Nico anna colas pepin which is this person's niece says here she was an afro-french senora what's a senora 
Tessinora was the name for the mulatto French African woman of the island of glory. Mulatto, huh? Mulatto? <laughs> Dash the hijack. So you see how it all almost sounds just like uh, the free people of color in the United States. Suzanne Pepin was the daughter of the Senora Catherine Baudet and the Frenchman Jean Pepin. All right. So what African? How is she Afro? Right. Because they're saying that her mom is Catherine Baudet, a Senora. So, so it must be mulatto. Mulatto with what? Mixed with what? Could be a Methodist, right? Remember, they're calling these people Methodists. And the Frenchman Jean Pepin. Sergeant of the French East Indies Company and the sister of Jean Pepin and the trader Nicholas Pepin. Her brother Nicholas was a leading figure of the island and often as the spokesperson of Gory in their dealings with the French authorities. All right, you can find this on Portrait of Island. It is noted that while Nicholas was literate, Annie was not, albeit her belonged to a very privileged class. She married the Frenchman Bernard Dupoy, all right, Dupoy with whom she had the son René Dupoy in 1774. Her spouse left the island during the yellow fever outbreak in 79. As was the custom in Gori, she did not take the name of her husband herself, but nevertheless had her child take her husband's name. She belonged to the leading figures of the Senora community on Gori Island, which played an important part on the French slave trade. Her brother had the famous Misson these clothes built for the family safe trade business. All right, so again, they're adding their hijack, even though we just debunked all this, right? So we got to touch the hijack. But it's, at least it's telling you that he built the house. It was their house. It was literally a mansion, guys. It had nothing to do with slaves. We've already gone over. There's no real uh, sources saying that that house was ever used for that. And that was not a port which boats can come and grab people from that door. Here's a picture of the house here, a drawing on Wikipedia. Okay. You see, where's the slaves? <laughs> where's the chains and all that? Where's the white man with the chains and all that? Real quick, we're in this book, uh, To Be Free in French, Citizenship in France, Atlantic Empire by Avlorel Semley. Mary de Saint Jean was the daughter of the Major of Gori, also a free man of color. The Major of Gori, and she was a free person of color. So again, conjecture to say oh, any of these people are African just because of that. But her mother, Anna Colas Pepin has an even more enduring legacy see in the historical record. Anna Nicolas, Anna Colas Pepin was the grandniece of Anna Pepin, who was rumored to have been the lover of the French governor of Senegal at the end of the 18th century. Anna Pepin has become almost a mythic character in the history of Gori, but traces of her prosperity also remain in the historical record. Art historian Mark Hinchman has uncovered records for nine homes that belong to Anna Pepin. At some point in her lifetime, her relatives and descendants carried forward her legacy, and Pepin's brother Nicholas Pepin, also a wealthy merchant who's the merchants, built the fancy house that has become associated with his daughter, Anna Colas, who also became rich and influential in her own right. That home, with its iconic double spiral staircase, was immortalized in a drawing by Adolphe S. Hastro de Riverdoux. The house is simply described as a residence at Gori, all right, not a slave house, a residence at Gori, house of Anna Colas. Today, the building has been transformed into a museum known as the Maison des Clavos, or the House of Slaves. Are right, you little, you hearing the drop? They're telling you that it was never called that. It was just simply called a residence. Today, today, right, the lie today, UNESCO, right, today they started doing the 70s, they call it the House of Slaves, one of the most infamous controversial visited tourist attractions in west africa why is it controversial because it's not true all right so i just want to read that telling you straight up that it was a house a residence not a slave quarter that was more modern story it says here portrait of an island the architecture and material culture of gori by uh, mark henchman says here Anne pepin is a major figure in the lore and history of gori she was the senior par excellence herself the daughter of senior and she reportedly became the companion of no less than french governor the chevalier de buffleurs shortly after his arrival in 1786 now again where were these people coming from were these french people white i gotta dodge the hijacks when letting you know she headed up a large prominent family her story beginning with her parents is worth considering in detail as an example of the dynamics and particulars of an extended multinational family nicholas pepin became a traitor and multiple archival documents refer to him the literate brother of the literate annie pepin as the island spokesperson the actors notaries leave no doubt as to nicholas pepin's prominence he was engaged as a witness 
asked to sign documents and called upon to help resolve disputes. There are hundreds of references to his trading activities, all right? These are primary sources they're talking about. He was no slave trader. He wasn't trading people like that through his house. The most famous member of the Pepin family, however, was not Nicholas or his daughter Anna Nicola, but his sister Annie. Her life is coincident with the major periods of Glory's building. Pepin was born circa 1758 and married a French trader from Bordeaux, Bernard Dupoy. Annie Pepin was approximately 16 years old when her son René Dupoy was born on June 5, 1774. His father, Bernard Dupoy, fled Gory's outbreak of yellow fever in 1779. Dupoy's absence left Annie Pepin unattached when the Chevalier de Boufflers arrived on Gory May 5, 1786. She was about 28 years old. All right, so that's a little story. That's who lived in this house. Nine about slaves going through their house. You guys got to understand. Now, one interesting thing about, about Pepin, right? Also known as Pepin, Pepin, Papin, Pippin, or Pippin. Pippin, right? Who also has this name? Pippin, huh? Very famous person we know, right? Scotty Pippin. It's the same family. So you could understand probably where his, uh, apart from his indigenous, look at the Indian in him, is so obvious. Now we know the Pippins and all these French Acadians and French people were definitely marrying indigenous women. It was part of their tradition and culture and law. All right, Pippin. Again, I thought it was very interesting. Pepin, Pippin is the same. Pepins come in all sizes, shapes, and spellings. All right. I just wanted to point that out, guys. Pippin, Pepin, Pippin, same family. Now, Dupoy was her uh, dad, Dupoy, right? Dupoy, Maison, Dupoy, French Quarters. It's on Bourbon Street, all right? These are the same families, Dupoy, that were coming from French Acadia. Dupoy, Dupois or Dupoy, almost like Dubois, right? Dupois, Dupoy, all right, is an Acadian surname. Check out my Acadian video so you guys understand who these Acadians really were. Dupois, Dupois, Acadians who found refuge in Louisiana. All right, Michael Dupois, Dupois. This is just one example. I just wanted to show Aunt Theory Dupois, right? Arrival place where? New Orleans, Louisiana. Where was she coming from? Acadia, right? It says here, compilers and editors. The crew and passengers registration list of seven Acadian expeditions. I right? listened by family groups of the refugee Acadians who migrated from France to Spanish Louisiana in 1785. Again, check out my video again. And that's a Dupoy, just like the people. That was his last name, Dupoy, the Methodist of Senegal. All right. <laughs> all right. So before we leave today, I just want to read uh, one more article from the Washington Post. All right says what Obama really saw at the door of no return, a disputed memorial to the slave trade. By Max Fisher, again, June 28th, 2013. When President Obama visited Senegal's Gory Island on Thursday, pausing for a moment to gaze west across the Atlantic Ocean from the door of no return, a famous symbol of the slave trade, you could almost hear the echoes of a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that he often cites, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Obama, speaking to reporters after the rare moment of solemnity, said it had been very powerful for him to see the world's famous site, which helped him fully appreciate the magnitude of the slave trade and get a sense in an intimate way of the hardships slaves faced. He called the trip a reminder that we have to remain vigilant when it comes to the defense of human rights. This is a testament to when we're not vigilant in defense of human rights and blah 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 blah, right Obama? The door was the point of which many, perhaps millions of African slaves took the final step from their home continent and onto the slave ships that would bring them to the new world if they even survived the journey. Or that's the story according to Gory Island official history anyway. The truth may actually be far more complicated. No one doubts the vast scale of horrific consequences of transatlantic slave trade. Well, we do. We've already debunked that, which destroyed countless communities in Africa. We debunked all this stuff, man. 
again, who would the Spanish and Dutch and English and Portuguese really enslave and right tearing the families apart? And what was the real history? We've gone over this. Forced millions into bondage and killed perhaps one in ten just during their voyage across the ocean. But it turns out that Senegal's famous door of no return might not actually have played a very significant role in that story. And the wide gulf between the myth of the door and its reality may actually be in itself a revealing symbol of our relationship to this dark chapter in world history. What Obama really saw at Glory Island's famous pink walled building may not have been a monument to slavery's history so much as its haunting legacy and ineffable memory. If you ask the stewards of this museum on Gori Island what happened there, they will likely refer you to the plagues on the wall, which say that millions of slaves passed through the building that Obama visited Thursday, now called the House of Slaves. That's been the story for years. In 1978, the United Nations cultural body formally named it as a World Heritage Site, all right? That's when the hijack started coming in and really trying to, you know, make this an official thing, this lie. But if you ask Africa scholars, they'll tell you a very different story. There are literally no historians who believe the slave house is what they're claiming it to be. Or that believe Gori was statistically significant in terms of the slave trade. It wasn't. Ralph Austin, who as Professor Emeritus at the University of Chicago, has written several academic articles on the subject, told the Associated Press. Historical studies, according to Austin and other academics who spoke to AP, suggest that 33,000 slaves were transferred from Gori Island, a huge number to be sure, but a tiny fraction of what the island's official history claims. All right, so dodge the hijack. Let's see those primary sources for these numbers. And of those, perhaps zero were moved from the house of slaves or out of its door of no return. None of them went through there anyways, so you're making it all up. Historians say the door faced the ocean so that the inhabitants of the house could chuck their garbage into the water. All right, you got to imagine not like garbage like today, 1700s, most likely a lot of it was mostly organic, right? Organic trash, organic something maybe the fish can even eat or dissolve in the sea. The Associated Press says no slaves ever boarded a ship through it, okay? Never happened. The historian Ana Lucia Araujo told the news agency it is not a real place from where real people left in the numbers they say, all right? It's not real. It's not real. Historians first uncovered the apparent truth about Gori in the 1990s, but almost 20 years later, the site's emotional power is still strong. People cannot let go. You gotta let go. Facts over feelings, as is its prominent place in a history that it actually had very little to do with. But that might be about something much bigger than just the persistence of myth or the challenge and overturning for a too good to be true story. Historians since realizing the banal truth of Gory Island in the 1990s have been struggling with how or whether to reconcile their accounting with the island's power today. You hear this? They're like, how do we explain this to people that it was a lie? How to square what actually happened at this house in Senegal with the door of no return, as it is today felt and perceived by visitors from Nelson Mandela to Obama. If no slaves ever actually stepped through the door, can it still be symbol of the slave trade, which did in fact reshape entire continents, all right, not just Africa, but America, continents of slavery still unfold in legacy? At what point does symbolism overshadow the reality? And we're going to end it right there with that deep question. How long are we going to entertain this lie just because it makes us emotional or because you want to make it a symbol, which is really a symbol of a lie? Ancestors turning over their graves. <laughs>